Welcome back, pet parents. So some of y'all know, if you've been here for any length of time, you know my dog started having some issues with noise phobia three years ago now when we moved to Texas. Well, not quite three years, maybe like two and a half years, because here's what happened. I adopted her when she was two and a half. She's going to be 11 this year. We lived in San Diego for a number of years. I never had any issues. None. Zero. She was like she wasn't scared of well no she was scared of things but she wasn't scared of any noises fireworks didn't bother her storms didn't bother her we moved to texas i didn't think anything of it our first new year's eve here the whole freaking neighborhood set off fireworks and she went into a tailspin and i was just like mortified i didn't know what to do because i had never encountered this with any dog i have ever had and I wasn't prepared. Fast forward, and I have since found out that Texans love their fireworks. I never know when fireworks are gonna be set off. That's one of my big issues. I have no idea. I literally, like, I know 4th of July, I now know New Year's Eve, but they set them off for everything. There are holidays, I didn't know existed that people are setting off fireworks for, and I'm learning about new holidays now. And it has escalated to thunderstorms. It has escalated to not just the thunder in the thunderstorms, but when the, what is it, the bare, barometric pressure changes, barometric pressure. that sets her off. So, yeah, that, that thing. So, I have tried and tried and tried so many things with, with Kimberly. I'm a big fan of, first of all, training. So one of the things I do like to do with dogs and people is introduce training. So we can actually use like desensitization techniques. But every time something unexpected happens or like here in Texas, like random thunderstorms, we have, I guess, have thunderstorm seasons here. I didn't know. And anytime something like that, it, it just throws a, a wrench in our plans and it kind of sets us back. So yes, we want to work on training. Yes, there are some supplements we can use. Yes, diet is also a, a very important factor. But what I wanted to talk to you guys about today, or actually I brought an expert on to talk to you guys about today. His name is Sean and he is the owner of Earth Buddy pet and uh he has some really cool ideas he a framework that he hasn't even told me about yet we're going to be learning this together today guys about what we can do especially in situations like these mine which i know is not unusual um but we got to prepare ahead of time and so sean is here to help us prepare that framework and get ourselves and our pets in a good position to not be so freaked out hopefully so sean thank you so much for joining us today <laughs> well thank you for having me again and i think this topic is a much bigger topic than just these acute situations like fireworks and thunderstorms which are really the biggest time of year when it comes to stress management for pets but when it's just acute i think we need to look at a bigger picture and like you said there's these different methods that we can use on their own they're great but I think taking this overall holistic approach, which is what we want to do in our world with our company and kind of what you promote, I think taking a holistic approach means bringing everything together. And the other side of that holistic approach is everything is connected. So there's probably some things that we don't think about sometimes that would allow that stress management and that process be a lot easier if we just made little tweaks to all these connecting parts of this holistic approach and the body itself. So um, there's a lot to cover and I'm happy to try to touch on a little bit, all of it, but at the end of the day, I will have a guide that um, people will be able to download in the next few weeks. And I think it'll be a really good starting process for a lot of people. Yeah, there, it is, it is a bigger picture issue. And I know one of the things I've been working on with my dog is her gut microbiome because I know it's not balanced because of the animal biome tests that I've done for her. And I mean, for me personally, it's just been such a struggle because she needs more fiber in her diet. She needs more 
for me, that looks like vegetation because she doesn't want to eat raw meaty bones. She doesn't want the fur items. She doesn't want the feather items. So, but she also doesn't want veggies. So it's something that I've struggled with, but I know that there it's, it all, it's all connected and, yes. um, and, you know, imbalances in the gut microbiome are going to create issues in how the brain fun because it's because they all talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> and but they're tell me like what what you see cool. as like this bigger picture and what we cool. where yeah, should people start you, focusing? Right. So I'm going to back up a second because I I, I want to be very clear. I am not a doctor, nor do I portray one on TV. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a neurologist. I am a pet lover who created a company to help his dog that had severe forms of stress and neurological issues, and I had no other options. And I made a lot of tough decisions. I made a lot of mistakes, and I've learned from many, many experts and people who have letters after their name over the years, what works and what doesn't, working with pet stores. I've learned a lot. And, you know, in part of learning, you make mistakes along the way. So I really took a step back and I said, we need to treat this more holistically. And you really use that word and define that word, which means everything is connected and we have to look at a bigger picture and not just say this ingredient or this molecule and CBD, which we'll talk about. But um, I think we need to have a bigger conversation and, uh, and that's why I'm excited to have this. So one thing I want to just touch on because it start, it's from the start. You did testing with Animal Biome, which is awesome. And one thing that I've stolen from, I will credit Dr. Odette Suter for it because I heard it from her. And she says, test, don't guess. So what I would say is before you even test, I'm, I kind of stole off of her term. I said, we should assess, don't guess. So what that means is we can empower ourselves as pet owners and go, let's assess my pet's current state. That means health, emotional, those kind of things. And I kind of break it into three buckets, which it's like a physical, emotional, and environmental. Now, all of those things are connected in some way, shape, or form. And some things we have control over and some things we don't. But at the end of the day, that filters into the gut with the physical and emotional. And then also, we can connect environmental to that because that can affect our overall microbiome health as well. So these things all kind of tie together, but how we address them is a big part of it. So assessing the physical part would be, you know, basic examples would be do just a general visible and physical touch assessment of your pet, move their joints around, see what their range of motion is. Literally, like you, your pet, especially if you have a good relationship with your pet, as a trainer, you know, it's like you should be able to touch things and manipulate things because they trust you. Mm -hmm. That alone can tell you a lot of like, are they irritated by something you touched? Okay, so right there, that can give us a clue. And these are all things that you can go to your vet when you're actually going to test or you go to an animal biome or you go do blood work. A basic blood work is like super helpful sometimes especially when you have all the resources that we do in our community of just access to reaching out digitally and online. So this is really important. So physical, you know, we could do the general joint health test. We can, you know, touch ears, skin and coat we can see if they're compulsively licking and scratching. These are all little clues that we can grab. The other physical would be, like you said, the gut health, like what does their poop look like? What is, what is their, current diet look like, which would lead more to, you know, more the environmental. When we get into emotional, we can look at from an assessment, we can look at what is my routine with my pet look like? Pets need a routine. Um, I think if you're chaotic and you're traveling all the time and you're not quite there for your pet, or you're not creating healthy routines for the people who do watch your pets, if you're traveling a lot, all of those things might matter. And then from an emotional standpoint, I think it's really important to point out what is our emotional state like with our pet? Are we going through stuff? Are we handling our own stress properly? Are we managing our own stress properly? Which is, there's no judgment there. It's just, it, it, it's the facts of life. We all have stress. And guess what? Our pets are amazing at absorbing whatever we're going through emotions. When we're excited, they're excited. When our 
when I, when we're down and we're sad, oh my gosh, I, I have so many stories of pets that I've grew up with and owned that would comfort me and also share in that, in that sadness or emotional issue. So we have to be very open-minded to go, Hey, maybe I'm causing some stress too, um, as part of our assessment. But then the emotional side is like, are we giving them enough activity? And that activity could be in the form of exercise, enrichment, whether that's chewing on stuff, playing more, um, just pl flat out being goofy or as simple as are we walking them enough? You know, these are all like really basic things that we can empower ourselves and we don't have to schedule a trip to the vet. And then when we do really think it's necessary to go to the vet, we have a good idea when we fill out all their forms and things that we have like a really good idea and perception of what our pet's emotional and physical state is. And then finally, environmental, which a lot of environmental, and we can kind of talk about different things because it, 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 again, it covers a lot of topics that bleed into the others, which environmental could be as simple as like air quality or water quality. These are things that are really hard to control. You know, right now I have a big concern with my dog because she is epileptic. Um, I have a big concern with her with um, lawn treatments. And I have a yard that is surrounded by five backyard neighbors. So I have the two corners. I have the one directly behind. I have the one on each side. Not all of them treat their yards, but I know some of them, by the judging their grass and their shrubbery, they really do take care of it. And they're doing extra stuff because we're in Colorado. We don't get a lot of rain. And to keep your grass green, you got to do stuff. Or you just got to accept that some of it's going to burn because we go weeks without water sometimes. So these are all things that I'm assessing right now, personally, with my own dog. Um, so that's another environmental kind of thing that we can assess. Not saying that there's like we can fix everything. But just having these assessments gives us a baseline, just like a basic animal biome test or a basic blood work would. That gives us a baseline. And now we have a little bit more information to move forward with. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. And I, I did want to interject that, you know, having a bunch of letters behind your name, and I mean, I have certifications, blah, 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 but like <laughs> having a bunch of letters behind your name doesn't mean you know something more than sure. the next person that doesn't have a bunch of letters behind their name like we i since you brought it up i just think it's important to address that like anybody can learn anything like you I, there's a i don't remember who was interviewing elon musk but he's like you didn't go to school to be a rocket scientist how do you know all this stuff and he's like i read books like information is out there for all of us <laughs> And, yeah. you know, the, sometimes I think those credentials can actually be detrimental in some cases. So just because then we get like boxed in this, um, you know, indoctrination of whatever school you went to or there's a lot that can be said for people that are self-taught or that have sure. alternative knowledge and learning. So I wanted I wanted to address that. But yeah, yeah the water thing that has been. Man, I, I've been, I, I don't want to say I've been struggling with it because I, I, I haven't, but it has definitely, if, every time I talk about water on like a reel on Instagram or something, people are always like, what, what are you talking about? How do you get your water? What do you like? Cause I, I just get filtered spring water, which isn't necessarily the best, but it's, it's pretty darn good. It's non-fluoridated and I add minerals trace minerals back to it because i don't like i understand that drinking dead water isn't hydrating necessarily for the body so yeah. but like people have so many questions about water when i bring it up they're like nobody thinks about it at all right well i think i think this yeah again i just want to be very clear like there's so many things but I think having a general assessment mm -hmm. of these things is really, we're not going to be able to fix every little thing and make this like, you know, completely enlightened Zen Buddha environment. And some people can kind of get close to that, but nobody becomes the Buddha, you know, like, so I think yeah. when you like specifically with like water, it's like, okay, maybe you can't do these, you know, extra measures to fix all these water issues that we have, but you can definitely help with hydration. You can definitely 
institute some things to increase their hydration. And something is simply just making sure your pet is more hydrated can have a significant impact on their stress management. So the, the general idea that I want to communicate is that stress is very pervasive and that there's a lot of different things that can be stressors. Some stress is good. Exercise, you know, is a stress response that creates adaptation to our muscles and makes us feel better and creates different feel good chemicals. So like because it's so pervasive, I think we need to be at least aware of all the different stressors in front of us and then go, okay, what can I actually address? And what can I start improving mm -hmm. on? That's probably really easy before I go take these extreme measures of going to the vet, getting, you know, sedatives and things like that, that a lot of people easily do because we're very programmed to go, let's just go to the doctor and get a pill. I, you know, I think a lot of Western medicine is very useful if we break a leg and things like that. But like there's needs to be some empowerment, especially when we're controlling a lot of these decisions for our pets. So I think we can take a lot of this into our own hands and address a lot of it very simply, or at least create some better stress management tactics prior to going to get a pill or, you know, making these really dream decisions. I think the, the main thing is, is like the importance of addressing stress as like a bigger topic than what I am wanting to talk about with like fireworks and thunderstorms is like stress is literally linked to every disease unequivocally. Like it's pretty much associated with almost everything. And if our pets are constantly just wound up and just ugh, all the time, this is not good for them long term. And I think, you know, we can talk about these specific scenarios and these acute situations where it's like this one thing triggers them. But over time, what does that do is my concern. And I worry about that. You know, I think about that a lot with my pet, my pets in the past that are no longer here. And I think about it now with my current dog. And it's like, they don't need to be in this like up and down state because over time that can lead to a lot of issues and create a lot more damage to their overall physical, emotional, and environmental health than, than just that one situation that we're trying to fix. So I hope that makes a lot more sense of just having this like overall idea of like, hey, we need to look at this as a bigger thing because it's way more important than just that one day that the booms are going off. We can really help their overall health with this and managing it better. So starting with all the little things, assessing all the little stressors yep. is kind of where your head is at right now. Is that what I'm understanding? Like just yeah, assessing like, everything that's it's going very on. Basic. And... Yeah. Like you can ask yourself, like, where, where am I at right now? You know, am I just kind of running around? And a lot of us are, you know, I, I run a company. I'm trying to help as many pets as possible right now because I know that they're already starting to sell fireworks in Colorado and they're starting to sell them probably in Texas and my neighbors, you know, thankfully my dog is, is blind and deaf, so they don't bother her. But I worry about the other pets in the neighborhood because we're in Colorado. We have, we have some predators here. We have coyotes, we have lions, we have bears, like, like these animals getting out and running away. Like that's terrifying. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in Colorado or not, it's like, that's the last thing I want. And I know once my neighbors light them off starting this month in June, they won't stop lighting them off randomly and unexpectedly until about October every year. And I don't worry about it too much, but then I think about my neighbor's dog, my other neighbor's dog, my backyard neighbor's dogs. I'm like, okay. And then the other side is like, I think just basically having a better perception of like how your pet is currently handling stress. So for an example would be maybe, maybe they're um, having some joint issues, but they're not really showing it, but they could also be just laying around all day and they're laying around all day because they don't want to get up. So that makes them kind of bummed out because they probably see you get up and down and they used to like to follow you in the kitchen and see what you're eating, see if you dropped anything. And now they can't and they have to sit there and pout because they're, not feeling well because their joints are achy. Um, the other example would be um, separation. So when you leave for the day to go to work, maybe they aren't showing it quite as like verbally, but 
you can see it, you know, and, and you as a pet owner probably know this, like you can kind of tell, even if they're not verbally showing it, they're like, oh, are you really leaving me right now? <laughs> and they're kind of like just a little bit more alert there. So like these little things, just paying attention to, it's just helpful to know because I think sometimes, especially smaller dogs, you have a small dog, right? I do. And she's okay. funny because she definitely lets you know she does not want you to leave. Sometimes she will sit right in front of the door so you can't open it. And when she wants to go with you, she will literally take her head and put it in the basket where her leash is and then look up at you. And she's <laughs> she's so expressive. <laughs> I I oh my god, I love that though. Like it just it's so true that they have souls and they're, they're, they're such individual personalities. And I think we, it's easy for us to just kind of broad stroke, you know, sizes and breeds and stuff. And it's just like, no, they're all their own beings and their own little individuals, <laughs> just like us. And we have our own things that bother us for no reason. We can't explain why. And I think those are like, just being aware of that alone is like a good starting point and going, this is a little, this is a little being. And they have things that, especially if they're rescues, it's like, I don't know what their trauma was. All of my dogs have been rescues for the past 20 years. I don't know what any of their traumas were, but they definitely had them. And it's like, I could figure out what bothers them and what like causes, you know, more stress. But at the end of the day, I just have to be aware of that and kind of understand that and start doing things to help manage that stress. We're never going to cure stress. Like... There's no cure for it. It's always going to be there. What I bring up the little dogs for is like a lot of times, some of these pets are so stoic, you know, cats and dogs are so stoic. They will avoid showing you kind of extreme emotions sometimes. And what we don't realize is their RPMs could be running way higher naturally. And we're just so used to it because we're with them every day and all the time that we think that's just their default state. When in reality is like, they're just always high alert. And they're running their cortisol levels up and just constantly wound up. So when the stress does come, it is like that extreme explosion where you have the fireworks go off, they take off, or they hurt themselves trying to jump out a window, which I've heard countless stories recently about. So we have to take into account just doing these general assessments and just really understanding our pet's emotional state and physical state and how all these things kind of bleed in. And then once we can do that, we can go, okay, let's start creating better habits, better routines, and maybe even incorporating things um, nutritionally or supplementally that can help. But I think having a bigger conversation about it is so much better than what a lot of times that we have pet owners come to us for is like, I'm freaking out. My dog is freaking out. I need your stuff right now. And it's like, I want to help you, but we mm -hmm. need a better plan than just throwing a bunch of CBD or CBG or other things that we make at it. I want to use it more holistically because that is the, the foundation of what we do is like, we want to address the whole body and yes, we can help. But if your, your pet is on level 5,000, they're probably not going to want to take my oil or my cookie and we're going to have a hard time. And we probably should have been taking some steps prior than you using a ton of CBD from doesn't matter who and expecting magic. And I, and I think that's why this conversation is so important because it's a, it's a more of a lifestyle thing. And I think we can help a lot with it as the owners of these pets. Yeah. So one of the things you brought up was cortisol and that is definitely i remember from okay we're getting ready to get a new forever dog life book but the original forever dog book rodney and karen were talking about the, these constant like elevated cortisol levels have been shown to actually reduce lifespan certainly we can say quality of life right but to actually reduce lifespan i think that is a really interesting thing um, to bring up as well to kind of put in people's brains as like, it's not just we want them to, yes, we want them to feel better. We want them to be more comfortable, more confident. Another thing I do like to tell people is to use positive reinforcement training every day. If it's five, 10 minutes, it doesn't matter. We're building confidence with our dog when we do that. And helping to build confidence can 
make them feel better about themselves and understand that they can make good decisions on their own. They don't have to rely on us for everything, blah, blah, blah. But tell me about cortisol. Do you mind talking about cortisol levels? So, I'm asking selfishly because no, I'm no, also I, in this like. <laughs> again, I, I, I'll take a step back and go, we need to have a more like comprehensive or the word I like to use because I, even though I think it's a little bit cliche. I, I want to take this more holistic approach. So when we look at these these mood chemicals, cortisol isn't necessarily bad. I, I, I think it's an, these chemicals are in our body for a reason, and they're not all bad. And certain times they're necessary for managing things. I think when we look at like a cortisol or in the more important side would be like the dopamine and serotonin pathways, how we're balancing these. The beautiful thing is, you know, with why we are so, you know, proud of what we do at Earth Buddy is like the endocannabinoid system is kind of the um, conductor of that orchestra of these tons of different chemicals and signaling, signaling pathways that we can help a lot. Um, so we have this conductor that we can kind of engage. System. So a couple of things, again, trying to, address of overall idea is the endocannabinoid system is something that we can address in multiple ways. We don't just have to throw CBD at it, although it's really effective at a lot of these things when we're talking about stress. But what we can do is we can start looking at the diet. We can look at our current diet and how our pet's actually doing, whether it's the greatest raw food and all the greatest supplements, our pet just might not be responding to it. And, and so we, we sometimes try to force things into, you know, a circle into a, a square peg, you know, however the saying goes, if I just mm -hmm. butchered it, but like, we try to force things sometimes and because we know it's good, we know it's better than kind of the status quo, but sometimes our pet being this individual might not be the best case. This is one of the reasons why we did a lot of work on creating different formulations different cannabinoids because saying that this one thing is going to do all these things maybe but not for every pet in the world it, you know because they're so individualized so everybody has their own endocannabinoid system and that system balances and signals chemical pathways does that make sense so far okay mm -hmm. so yeah. one thing that we have to think about too is that the gut is our second brain, you know, they talk about the gut brain access, but the gut actually, you know, there's so much to this. You can look at it as a second brain because it does things completely autonomously than our brain sometimes that, you know, we can talk about the enteric nervous system and how it's made up of neurons that are found in the gut. And then 80% of our immune system is in the gut. 90% of our serotonin is produced in the guts. These are different factors that we can take into account and go, okay, where can I address the easiest? And I think we can look at the diet and just generally assess their diet. And how are they responding? Are they still itchy and scratchy, even though we're feeding a better food? Um, are we doing, um, you know, are we looking at their poop regularly? Because it does change. Our gut microbiome changes throughout the day based on what we eat. And then we have to factor in environmental. What can that do in conjunction with the diet? So I think it's um, important that when we look at these different chemicals, we can balance them, but we have to do it with things that we can actually control if we're trying to avoid having to go really deep into really expensive testing and really um, costly drugs and treatments. Um, we can kind of address this when they're still relatively healthy and we can we can attack it very naturally um and just means like simply just assessing their skin coat teeth you know demeanor physical health i think these little basic assessments will give us a better path forward and then yeah we can manage that cortisol um but here's the thing i think having good stress management techniques as a trainer like this is so important i think using something like CBD in conjunction with these desensitive te techniques would be amazing. For instance, like obedience training, if they're super reactive to dogs, um, I think 
you can do that in a very controlled setting while taking a CBD or even some of our other formulations that have like CBG, which is less sedative. And you can use that as a tool to do those, you know, reactive training exercises. And you can do it very like gently. The, the, the example I use for a lot of people that have uh, is with their pet that has issues with travel in the car. And I had a little guy named Tito that was just, he hated the car. And so what I started doing with him, to your point with like, you know, just slightly stressing it is I know that he's going to be stressed when I go to the car regardless. So how do I start desensitizing him to that? So the way I started doing it with Tito was I started, I started pretend leaving with him and getting him in the car and I wouldn't even go anywhere. And so I tell a lot of parents, I'm like, have a routine when you leave with them in the car where you give them our CBD oil or a treat 30 to 45 minutes out and you get in the car and you just sit in the car with them for like five minutes and then you get back out and go back inside and do that a couple of times over the weekend. And over time, we're building a healthier association with it. And it's like something so simple that we can take 10, 15 minutes out of our day to do and start using our product as a tool rather than looking at it as like, we're going to just cure the stress and knock them out in the car or going the pharmaceutical route and having to rely on a like really heavy sedative, which is always, uh, it's a bummer, but I get why people have to do it because their pet will be a problem for the people around them and for their own safety. So I get the, I get why people go to that, but we can create mm -hmm. better routines and better habits in conjunction with training and supplementing. I think there's a better way to do this. And so I, I think when we talk about fireworks and thunderstorms, we can't predict that. But what we can start doing is, like you said, we can start playing the music and start, or playing the, the sounds. They're not the same all the time for every pet, and it's not going to have the same effect. But maybe just having a more like heavier uh, dose of exercise during these months of June and July. We're just creating a, a more higher intensity exercise. Maybe we're taking them out and playing with them more. We're giving them more enrichment toys to kind of lick and and kind of soothe themselves more frequently. I think all these things leading up to that. So when the booms do go off, then we can't control. We have a better opportunity to have them a little bit more relaxed. Um, um, but Well, okay. So what I heard you talking about, yeah. What I heard you talking about was more exercise, more enrichment, right. especially like yes. the licking and the chewing. Cause I know licking and chewing are very calming activities for dogs. So. So when we come to these like little basic things that we can kind of kick up, knowing that we have no ability to predict fireworks, whether we can do a little bit, but in Colorado, sometimes we get storms that just come over the hit, the mountain and it's just like, oh no, that's getting here really fast. I don't know if my CBD is going to kick in. So it's like, it's hard to predict a lot of these things. So I think just having general habits of like, okay, I hear them starting to you know, I, I know they're home now and I know that's the house that lights off the fireworks. Maybe start incorporating the lick mat a little bit earlier and maybe having the CBD on that lick mat. So like little things that we know, because here's what I tell every pet parent with our products. It's like, we are not um, gospel about our dosage. We're not like saying this is the only dosage that your pet needs. What we say is, you know, your pet better than us. So here's a really safe starting point to start with our products but then now we're going to really expand on that and really push the fact that we should be incorporating enrichment toys like lick mats are like a lifesaver in my house for my dog um, with her with her neurological issues. So I have to have those ready. I have frozen anchovies on a lick mat in my freezer ready because I know the value of what they do for her. Um, the other things are like just the exercise and, and just increasing that amount of exercise in the summer. So then maybe they're just a little bit more tired um, when it is starting to become, you know, sundown and you start hearing the loud booms that maybe they're just like, you know what? I'm exhausted. I've worked hard today. I, I, they, they're annoying me. They're still annoying me as the, as the pet, but maybe I can just tolerate them more. And that's the bottom line. And the bigger picture I'm trying to get to is like, just creating better stress management tools 
is such a healthier way leading up to this really stressful season of fireworks and thunderstorms. And we're starting to get thunderstorms here pretty uh, regularly in Colorado, but then it dries up and then the fireworks start going off and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, and to your point about like environment and enrichment and I, when I went out of town and my dog stayed at my pet sitter's house and she has oh, two safe, safe. and normally my dog is not, she doesn't love other dogs. We had another dog when we adopted her and she was very standoffish. She's just not a, a dog dog. But she's she does pretty well with these two Aussies and goes on walks with them regularly and, and things. So she stays over there when um, we go out of town. And there was a terrible thunderstorm, millions of dollars of damage thunderstorm that came through during oh that week. And she did really well, like just having the other two dogs there being in an environment where there were other two dogs that were calm and not freaking out she did mm. so well and she has actually since then since we got back even though she's by herself now in our house with us has been doing a little bit better with the fire like wow. i'm not saying that to say go out and get other dogs right but like right. to just understand your individual animal and like different things that can be helpful and and little tweaks and changes that can be made to to help oh make, help them feel better it's funny you you reminded me of the situation where like you ever hang out with somebody and they just seem just a lot more patient and they're just like they're very just like their their demeanor is more calming and like just from being from them you feel better it's like that has to happen with our dogs. Maybe cats are a little trickier with yeah. that one, but but with dogs, it's, I bet you if they met somebody the way we would, that just has a calmer demeanor and they just make you feel better to be around them. They're like, maybe I don't have to be so stressed. So like again, that's a great example of like, you know, you're you're bringing them together in a healthy environment. You know that the other dogs are safe and not hyper reactive, but those are like little things that we can do, and also that that socialization knowing that the fireworks might go off might be healthy to just kind of wear them out you know we did a um with my daughters we took my dog who hates the car too my current dog iggy we took her to a um, role-playing seminar for disaster preparedness which is a big thing i'm like really passionate about i can get into but um we had the marshall fire here in colorado it was devastating. Many pets were lost. You guys have fires in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's nothing to mess around with, but the, the role playing of that, just having her go and then, you know, act like we were in a situation where we were evacuated and like having her go through that, have the stress in the car. And then on the way home, kind of like dealing with her and managing the stress in the car. When she got home, oh my gosh, she was so pooped. She laid right on the kitchen floor. And usually she lays like kind of a little bit further away in the, on the carpet. She laid right on the kitchen floor. I was just like, you hear the big sigh, the <sighs> just like, oh my God. I'm like, yeah. I love that. <laughs> and so like something as, as good as just like taking them out for like a, a busy day with you. And yeah, you might have to deal with the car stress or the little stressors, but guess what? When they get home, and those booms go off, they're like, I'm so exhausted from all the things we did. And it's just like us. It's like, you have a Saturday, you're going to do the yard work, you're going to do all your shopping, you're going to run all the errands. And when you get done midday, you're like, okay, I need a nap. <laughs> you know, nothing's really going to bother me the rest of the day because I got all my things done. So I think those are like really basic habits. Whereas like, I think, you know, even though I kind of cover a lot of ground with these, these buckets that we have to assess there's really simple things that once we start having a better idea are so easy to, to, to manage. Now, the, the really big thing that I want pet owners to understand is, you know, we have to be kind to ourselves and we can't overwhelm ourselves because that'll cause us our stress. So we, we, we do this assessment and we're like, Oh my God, there's so many things wrong. We have to be nice to ourselves. We have to be patient with ourselves and go, what can I address immediately? What can I do tomorrow? What can I start working on in a couple of weeks? You know, what is like something cheap that I can do? 
right now? And then what do I have to, you know, maybe budget for in the long term? But just having that kind of attitude of like, I don't have to do everything at once is really important, especially with these really severe neurological issues in pets. I think the 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 default is to, oh my God, I got to change the diet. I got to change the lifestyle. I got to change all the supplements. I got to take them off everything they're on. And what happens a lot of times is it actually, you know, exacerbates the problem. And I've done this in other ways with, with my own pets where you panic and you want to do everything because we know so much about holistic healing and health and all these things. But I think we have to just be kind with ourselves and go, what can I do that's really simple right away? You know, one foot in front of the other. And I think the 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 value of doing this now and, and going into June and now and then July, I think if we can have just little baby steps leading up to the, the fireworks time, the heart of the fireworks time, I should say, I think we can be in a much better place by the time July 4th and then the weeks after that they keep lighting them off. We can be in such a better place in a month, but rather than trying to like reinvent the whole uh, routine and situation for our pet. Does that help? Yeah, I, I think so. And it is, like you were saying, it is a much more holistic approach, though having something extra that we can add in those times of stressors can still be helpful. And yep. I I would imagine for you, that's probably like a, a full spectrum CBD product in that moment. What it, what, it, what is your go-to? Uh, we did a 2022 study where we assessed real-world data of about 70 pet owners um, in the middle of Ju or from like July 1 to about July 22nd, and we um, did a series of basic um, stress assessments that the vet would literally have you fill out if you went to them. So we're talking about uh, severity of stress, severity of or daily stress, um, overall stress. So these are different, you know, ways to look at it. And every day we we message these pet parents. And what we saw and what we were trying to figure out is like, does it work right away for every pet? Yes, it did for some, but not all of them. Um, but what we wanted to see is like, over time, if you can use a low to moderate dose consistently, and when the big stressor comes, you can increase that dosage of our product just a little bit, just a little bit. We saw almost a 30% decrease in overall stress in all of the pets. 90% of the, the 70 pet owners said that it was overall effective at using a low to moderate dose. And this is in three different forms. This was, they had the option of an edible form in our treats. They had the regular full spectrum oil, which we have different size bottles of the same strength. And then we had our quick calm, which is a completely different product than the other two in terms of the form that is used. And across the board, we got unbelievable data. And the whole goal was to see like, can you get a low to moderate dose and still see a response? Because when it comes to the specific product in terms of calming, our whole goal is being a natural plant extract in a product is to have minimal effective dose. It is not more is better. And it's not a, dr we take the drug philosophy often and go, I give them the thing and it acts on the specific thing right away. And it's like every pet is so different. So we would rather you have the lowest minimal effective dose to get the best, you know, desired result without any side effects. And so that's the whole idea behind a natural product and, and the way we look at dosage. So what we found is these low to moderate doses daily, and then just increasing it a little bit, if you can, 30 to 45 minutes before things that are, you know, specific to your pet stress, we usually get the best mm -hmm. response. But when you try to do it in the heat of the moment, and your pet is revving at, you know, 7,000 mm -hmm. RPMs they're probably not going to take an oil. They're probably not going to take a treat. One of the reasons we created quick calm was for this exact reason, because it's a squirt and, you know, whether they want it or not, because it's got a very unique delivery system in that one, it's a squirt that you can squirt it right in their mouth, but two, it's water soluble in distilled water. So what it does is it's going to absorb mucosally regardless. And then once they swallow it, it's going to get in their bloodstream and peak their blood levels with CBD a little bit faster. Now, again, I'll be very clear. 
if their pet is on level 7,000 RPMs and they're just revving and they're going through the roof, I don't think it's just going to snap them out of it. And all of a sudden they're like enlightened Buddha dog. But if we can even get it in their body faster, rather than trying to hold a, a treat in front of their face or trying to squirt a dropper of oil in their face, I think this is a, a much more effective delivery system in those cases, but it's not going to have the same response if we do it in a calmer state. So that's the other side of it is with dosage and full spectrum CBD, I think giving it to them in a very calm state is very important. And it's one of the reasons why we're not super big on just, you know, putting it on the gums or rubbing it right in the mouth because some pets might not like it. If they do great, but if they hate it, now you're going to be stressed giving it to them. And now there's like this weird thing where mm -hmm. you're like forcing something in their mouth that they don't like. And now they have an association with that. They're not dumb. They're going to look at what you're getting out of the drawer that has the stuff they don't like. And right away, their, le their cortisol levels are going to go up and they're going to be like, oh God, oh God, oh God. And then that product is going to be hit or miss on whether, you know, it's going to have the true effectiveness that we want it to. So the way we look at it mm -hmm. is, you know, step one, what is my, what is my stress level like right now? Maybe take a few deep breaths, do some belly breathing, you know, relax, maybe take some yourself. <laughs> it's like, we gotta, we gotta just, we gotta relax. So then once we do that, if we have to put it in something yummy, maybe it's not the most, Maybe they only eat people food because you never let them have it. Maybe we got to give it to them in something that's really palatable, but just a little piece of something. You know, I've had pet owners with cats use bread because they're like, my cat doesn't care when I put it on bread and my cat's a carb kitty, you know, and they're like, I can get it in their body that way. And then they're not foaming at the mouth or whatever. So I think making that experience enjoyable will allow them to start relating. When I get the stuff, this special treat, I some for some reason, feel better. <laughs> and so we get kind of a two for there is like, they're getting a treat. Mm -hmm. So they feel like a reward is involved. And then we're also engaging their ECS that manages all these mood chemicals. And we kind of get a two for one without being like, take the thing, squirt, squirt, or, you know, yeah. drop it in the mouth. So yeah. I, I think that's a better way to look at dosage. And then overall, you know, using a full spectrum product is going to be safer, safer for the pets less processed, which is kind of the general idea we want to do for our pets in terms of nutrition anyways. Yeah. So just obviously every animal is an individual. My dog, that's kind of what, what I do with my dog is, and I didn't do it for the anxiety reason, but she had elevated liver enzymes and milk thistle didn't cut it. So I um, did a full spectrum hemp and brought her liver enzymes down with that. So she gets 20 milligrams a day. I take 40 milligrams a day. I think I told you that once and you were like, you take that much. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't feel it. <laughs> Jessica, you bring up a great point. So your dog is how, how much in weight? She's about 14 pounds. Okay. So one thing I talk about, we have a dosage card that we, we, we share with a lot of stores and we send them out to customers a lot of times. The dosage card that we have is literally just a, a guide to like, this is how you should look at dosing. So if your pet is smaller, likely their, their world is bigger and scarier to them than it is us. So naturally, they're just going to be a little bit more stressed. So yes, I know a lot of pet owners with chihuahuas and smaller dogs, you know, the small breed dogs that are just generally more stressed. So yeah, they might need a bigger dose. The other side is they might metabolize it faster because they're leaner, their digestive tract is faster. And then you take the other side of it. Think about if you're super overweight, if your pet is overweight, you might need to use more because you're metabolizing it slower and it might stay in the body longer. So you might mm -hmm. have to use more because you metabolize things slower and you know, you do not move things along as fast because you are overweight. These all are factors that we can look at with our pets. So I, it's so funny. You bring up that you have a little dog that has a pretty decent sized dose. And then you're like, I do this dose and I, and I barely feel it. Whereas like I'm a lightweight and I can get a great benefit off of like 10 to 15 milligrams. I also think the administration and the, the, um, the formulation is a big part of it. And I think 
one of the reasons why we have such a extensive line of different administrations of product and formulations is we are flat out saying, we don't know what's going to be best for your pet, but we have some ideas of what this has worked best for based on the scientific data available and what we've heard back from humans and pets using this for. And then we kind of go that route and go, this is what we would gear it towards. But I've had customers that literally come to me and go, your, we have a CBG product that has a little bit of CBD in it. And they said it's amazing for their dog that has achy joints. And I was usually recommending that for older, more gut issue dogs. So it's just, it really depends on the pet and the individual. And I think I love that you're like, I'm using this because this is what I figured out for my pet. But that doesn't mean every pet owner has to do that. Some, you know, my sister has chihuahuas. She's like a chihuahua hoarder and they're really tiny. Shout out Savannah. She, they're really tiny and none of them have teeth. And so, you know, she could take one drop and either rub it on their gums or she can just crumble our treats and give them little pieces and they totally chill out, but they're chihuahuas. So they're always just like, "Mm," and they're like any new people I have to bark at you or bite your ankles when you run away, Mm -hmm. no matter what, you know, just figuring out what's best for her pets is going to be different than yours, different than mine. You know, my dog with her neurological issues, she's, she's at a really high dosage, Mm -hmm. but I had to work towards that over a year's time, you know, really digging into the, the data on what these neurological issues have seen the best results with. So I, I think it's very important to know, like your pet is an individual and we're just giving you a really safe, low starting point. And if it works at that, guess what? We save more money. We don't have to use as much. We're not putting more fat and oil into their body than they may need. I think, you know, all those things are are great tools to look at when it comes to dosage for CBD. And then, you know, kind of relating to the relative topic of thunderstorms and fireworks, you know, I think using it in combination and having a routine daily in a dosage weeks, if not months, hopefully before. And then when we kind of know sun's going down. This is when the kids are home. This is when dad wants to show off for the neighbors. They start lighting them off. It's like, all right, I'm going to give it to them like an hour before, just in case, and maybe give them a little bit more leading up to that. So I think just having awareness of those routines and using a, a regular dosage, even at a small level, will start training their ECS to just be more calmer state and be able to just kind of take a deep breath when those stressors hit and just be like, Oh, this sucks, you know, but at least they're just doing that as opposed to, I hate my life level stress. Yeah. My gosh. Yes. Well, yeah. So start now. It's never too early to start and try to pick up on all of the little stress, like clean up all the little stressors. That makes me think of... People might hate me for this. That makes me think of um, Rudy Giuliani's New York City. That's how he cleaned up New York City, right? It's it's crap again. But um, (laughs) you have to pay attention to the little things. And then the big things start working themselves out. People are going to hate me for saying that, but that, that is what it is. <laughs> well, I, I think you can just take it from an individual standpoint as people, you know, when I find that I'm stressed, I, I ask like three things and these are very basic thing, three things that you can ask. And you can do this with your pet too. Honestly, have I exercised today? Have I drank enough water and have I eaten enough food and what kind of food have I eaten? Is it good or bad? Yeah. So those three things. If I'm like having a rough diet and I feel overwhelmed and like, I'm like, if I just answer those three questions, there's probably something that is probably not quite optimal within those that I feel so overwhelmed Mm -hmm. and kind of like undertake. And you can do that with your pet. What am I feeding them? Have they drank enough water today? Did they get enough exercise? And I think starting there is just a really simple way. And when I do that for myself, it's usually like, I just need to go exercise or, oh, I better go drink water (laughs) or I've over caffeinated. So, you know, like those kind of things are really easy when you ask those three questions. And from an individual standpoint, you can apply that to your pet too. For me, it's how much, how much sugar have I had today? (laughs) (laughs) That's That's awesome. I, I blame, I, I blame 
I'm looking at my belly. I blame it on cortisol, but it's probably sugar. <laughs> well, I mean, think about if you're if you're overeating highly processed, highly palatable foods over and over, that makes you want to eat more of them. Like there's data on that. And you know, we can argue about, you know, the 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 more highly processed pet foods too doing the same thing. They want to eat more than I, you know, I'm sure you hear this more than I do, but I hear it all the time. My pet always looks hungry. I just want to give them more, you know, and it's like, no. And I, and I, I will pat myself on the back. I've done a really good job with this with my, with my dad specifically. He has this beautiful dog. She's in her senior phase. And I'm like, dad, you've done amazing with her till now. Just keep her lean. Because like at the end of the day, a leaner dog that might look skinny is probably going to be a lot healthier than the one that is starting to put weight on, especially as they get older. And this go, this is the same for us. You know, the, a really simple thing is like, are you are you eating more processed food? Are you eating more than you're expending in terms of energy? A lot of times, if you can just pick that out, you can start helping a lot of these different mood balancing chemicals. And same with our pets. So you know, giving them the the exercise they need versus how much they're eating versus you know, the enrichment that we give them. So I think these, you know, rounding it out back to like the environment, emotional, physical, we can, we can address those things. And I like the, the, did I drink water? Did I eat enough? And did I exercise? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it works for all of us. I like that a lot. Well, is there anything else? I, I mean, I think we've covered it, but do you have anything else that you wanted to? Yeah, I think I was just going to reiterate, like, I'll have a guide that will be a little bit more comprehensive to what we talked about. I really hope people can, um, can, can, you know, at least use that as a starting point. And I'll have a lot of resources, you know, from the training aspect, I would love to get more input. Um, and then ultimately, like more uh, tests that they can do if they want to go further, if it's really more severe things, this is what you do. And I think one other thing that I really want to promote is like, because next month is uh in june is pet emergency preparedness month um i think it's just important to have plans in place if there is an emergency with your pet god forbid um i think having an emergency plan a basic first aid kit covers a lot of the bases for your pet but just you know in terms of colorado with the fires and stuff having a basic evacuation bag with food treats little toys blankies that they might like um, these little things are just really simple steps that relieve a lot of stress in our bodies, but also for our pets, at least we know they're covered. Um, and I think that kind of, uh, ties into everything we talked about today and just relieving stress in the house, not just our pet. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It's really, really important well, on that topic. What do you think about microchips? I think they're okay. Um, I think if you have a dog that you're significantly worried about running away all the time and maybe has a history of doing it, especially during 4th of July, maybe that's the case. But at minimum, definitely have their tags up to date leading into June and July. Like definitely update their tags, make sure you have the right number, the right address on there. Um, you know, I live in a neighborhood, so we're all pretty close. And at, at worst, I can get on the neighborhood app and go, hey, my blind and deaf dog is wandering around and I can't find her. She doesn't do that. I, I'm very cautious of her. I've never microchipped a pet myself, um, but I see a value in it, especially after the disasters that we had with the fires and other states that have had fires. I think there's nothing more traumatic than not only having to be evacuated from your house and then also losing your pet. It would be devastating to me. So I think, you know, there's probably a, a both sides of like why you should, why you shouldn't. But I think it's like in those cases, if you know you're in kind of a weird part of a country, maybe that's the best way you can track your pet down in an extremely stressful mm -hmm. situation like a fire, or, you know, a wildfire. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's all really excellent advice. Where where can people find you, especially this, when um, you have the guide available, that'll be, I guess, posted on your socials and all the places. Yeah, we're going to promote it. We already have a, a pet emergency preparedness guide that's already out. They can oh, awesome. download it for free. We have the whole blog launching on the first, so that's Saturday. So the first of June, we're going to launch that, but they can go on the blog right now at earthbuddypet.com and just 
look through the basic steps and then we have a downloadable guide that they can look at. It's all really basic stuff. It's all stuff that you probably have in your house already, but just having it together is the way to go. And then uh, when we do kind of the stress management guide, it'll be a nice thing to pair with that emergency guide because they all kind of go together. So um, I think they're really simple and I like having things where they're compiled and they're not just an infomercial for Earth Buddy, although our products will be in both. It's like, hey, you know, you definitely should have some some backup CBD in your emergency preparedness guide because that pet's going to be stressed too. But then also for your stress management guide, yeah, it's definitely something we want you to incorporate to your pet, especially during this time of year in the summer months with fireworks and thunderstorms so frequent. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much um, for coming on, for helping to educate people and giving them a bit of a framework because uh, it is it is different. You know, it is uh, it's a lifestyle choice yeah. and change and a bit of a paradigm shift probably for some people. Um, but that's OK. That's that's kind of what we're here for is to change people's paradigms and, and lead them down a more holistic path. So thank you so much. Okay, so one last thing um, for your amazing audience and all the pet owners that get to see this, we created a specific discount code for all the pet parents. Um, and that discount code is going to be for 20% off all of our calming and CBD products. So it'll be mostly treats, oils, quick calm. Um, and it's uh, use discount code TPPR. And that'll be for 20% off. And we're going to run that uh, into mid July. So we really want to make sure that they're getting on top of it. So as soon as this launches, hopefully everybody can get it and start dosing and getting their pet in that more calm Zen state and creating all those good routines and habits. So thank you again. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And Jessica, thank you too. I mean, the people you have on here are amazing and I always learn from your guests. I learn from you and, uh, I don't claim to know everything, so I'm always trying to learn more, and I appreciate everything you're doing with the people you have on and the information you put out there. It's awesome. So keep doing it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.